Welcome to Janet's Planet, where we're traveling at the speed of thought. And today I'm delighted to have my good friend and one of my classes, favorites, Artemis Westenberg, back to share with us about women in space. Artemis is President Emerita of Explore Mars and CEO of Explore Mars Europe. Artemis, take us away and inspire us again. Okay, well, today we're going to talk about women in space. How many are there? Are they really part of it? Um, how did we get there? You know, did, did women are part, are part of it from the start? And if not, why not? How much was happening? So, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. But, you know, the ladies you're looking at are the, the ones that were still alive and are, were able to come to the uh, launch of the, oh gosh, help me here, Janet, was this the... the this was Eileen Collins, who was the first uh, pilot of the space shuttle, and they came yeah. down. Yeah. Yeah, I know it was Eileen Collins, but I don't know which shuttle it was. I don't know whether it's the Atlantis or the Endeavor. I, I want just to say know. it was Atlantis, but let me check and see. Yeah, let I think see. it was the Atlantis too. Anyway, these ladies were her personal invitation, and they uh, they were there because you know if you're an uh, you're an astronaut, you're going into the uh, up to space, you can say, of course, these friends or these relatives, I want to be witnessing what I'm going to do, witnessing my, uh, uh, you know, my departure, like, you know, you're going to a train station and you're all going to wave, well, something like this. So, um, so she invited these ladies and, and NASA then realized, you know, who these ladies were, because these were the ladies that were, and I'm going to talk about that a bit more later on, about who were uh, tested, who were just as able as the Mercury 7. And, you know, it happens to be seven ladies here too, but, you know, the ladies were 13 of them and the men were seven that were selected. Anyway, these ladies were just as capable. They were amazing pilots. They were, you know, they were healthy. They were tested with the same tests as were done with the gentlemen, uh, but uh, Dwight Eisenhower and some others decided that they didn't like it, the whole idea, you know, you needed to be a, uh, an astronaut only if you were a fighter pilot. Now, these women, like I said, they were pilots and they actually flew fighter jets. They flew them when they were, you know, uh, uh, built uh, from the factory to where they were needed, whether that was the Navy or the Air Force, didn't matter, they flew them there. And they tested them also, you know, for the factories. Now, you know, you build a plane, you're going to, you know, do it for several test runs before you hand it over. And that's what they did. And it was all amazing. Um, they were absolutely amazing, but they were not actually fighting in the Second World War because they wouldn't allow that. So, you know, so these ladies were out. Well, like I said, NASA uh, realized who these ladies were, not just, you know, some uh, some old ladies, uh, I don't know, her aunts or something. I have no idea what NASA thought at first that they were. And they realized, you know, these are, you know, seven ladies of the original Mercury 13. And so they gave the ladies a VIP treatment from there on, which is absolutely what they should have done, you know, years and years before, not just when, when um, let me see, how do I get into the next one? Okay. okay. So, you know, we're talking space. Who is doing space at that particular moment in time? Well, two countries, Russia and USA, and they were actually fighting. I would almost say like little boys or girls, and, you know, they were fighting who is best, who is, you know, strongest, who is smartest type of thing. It wasn't really a good thing. You know, it, it wasn't very uplifting uh, if I look back at that time, but, you know, it got us into space. That's true. You know, because wh where were they proving that they were the best? They were proving that by trying to get humans into space and even humans all the way to the moon. Now, you know, you had some moonwalkers, of course. We all know there have been guys on the moon. That's the thing, you know, there have been guys on the moon. These 12 guys walked on the moon, wonderful, of course, but, you know, no ladies, no ladies whatsoever, kind of strange, because, you know, how were these guys selected? Well, that all started not with the Apollo astronauts, but with the group before them, 
and that were the Mercury seven astronauts, seven astronauts that were selected after you know some rigorous uh, testing, quite a bit of rigorous testing actually. And these were all fighter pilots. And I must tell you that I will show you many women later on, even you know the Chinese uh, astronauts, the female astronauts, they are all fighter pilots as well. So this whole idea that we've been you know veering off from in, in America or in Europe, in Japan, that you know, you don't need to be a fighter pilot, you might be a scientist or very, you know, medical scientist or a biologist or some other science. No, in this time, you are still, you know, a fighter pilot. And like I said, China, China still is selecting uh, astronauts for only from fighter pilots. Anyway, so these were the seven men. Now, of course, you know, the, the audience loved this idea. All the general American public was very much in love with this idea of these young guys. These look healthy, you know, they are, you know, vigorous. And of course, they were kind of heroes being fighter pilots. And now they're going into space. Wonderful. Yeah, you know, but to sell it to space, actually, they used women, their own women. Now, what? who were the Mercury 13? It were these women. And there are actually only 12 because I cut off one of them. <laughs> I, uh, I, there was another one. I think that was Jerry Cobb. I'm not sure. Jerry Cobb, yes. And yeah, I, I cut off Jerry Cobb because the, this is an, 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 an these were a two pages from a Time magazine. And if I put both of them on, the whole page on, you actually, I couldn't have said their names. And uh, and then actually it wouldn't really have fit in my slide because all, all the writing would have even been smaller than this. <laughs> but these were the ladies, you know, that Randy Loveless, the guy that was responsible for selecting the male Mercury astronauts, he, he had this idea, you know, why not, you know, test some female pilots and see how well they, they do in these tests that we put these Mercury uh, 7 guys through. And, um, you know, they were actually doing better than the, than the men. Um, and, you know, they were, like I said, they were very dedicated pilots. They were in good health. There were far more pilots than just these 13. I mean, they, these were the 13 that, uh, that uh, Dr. Loveless um, invited, but he could have, you know, picked more because there were many in the Second World War and right after it, quite a number of women flew and had, you know, had lots of experience. But like I said, they weren't in the Navy or in the, in the Air Force as uh, fighter pilots because that wasn't allowed. Not because they weren't capable, just because it wasn't allowed. Like in the Netherlands until very recently, no woman could be a firefighter. Only very recently, that was one of the, uh, you know, profession from the, one of the last two professions that I finally could have applied for. I'm too old to do that. And I'm not really sure that I would be capable as being a firefighter. But for most of my life, I would have been, you know, it would have been impossible to, uh, to apply. The same is, do you actually know that I'm too short to be a policeman in the Netherlands? I'm not that short, but in the Netherlands, if you're uh, less than one meter and 63 centimeters, you cannot be a policeman because they believe that you will not have the authority to, you know, be a policeman if you're short, really. Mm. Okay, so th these are all these real, real strange ideas. And the same with these, pi with these pilots, with these women, you know, you had, they had ideas that this is the way it's supposed to be. Like I said, there were many more women who were, you know, using pil uh, airplanes, were flying them. This is just one of the examples Here's another one. Uh, this was a whole group of WASP pilots, of women pilots that would be uh, helping. And she was actually flying bomber uh, uh, planes because a B it stands for a bomber plane, a B-26, a B-29. Those are not, you know, uh, toy planes. These, these were the planes that they were using to fight the Second World War with. And like I said, the only thing these women were allowed to do is was testing them once they were completed in the factory and then, you know, bring them over to the male pilots, uh, the, the male fighters in the army, in the Navy, in the uh, Air Force that would then would use them. Uh, and the two little ladies are just... All right, we're experiencing oh, just... Yeah, your screen uh, uh, froze for just a second, but you're back, it looks like. 
Okay. Okay. Now, like I said, fighter pilots, you needed to, to be a fighter pilot or you couldn't be an astronaut. It's a good thing that they lost that idea a long time uh, before the first fighter pilot in the US uh, Air Force, you know, was appointed before female Air Force fighter pilot, because that was only in 1993. Uh, Jeannie Mary, Mary Levitt was the first one to be a fighter pilot, and she actually also became her uh, the commander of her squadron. She was a good fighter pilot, but like I said, if we had waited until women fighter pilots uh, would be there, there would have been no female American um, astronauts for even longer than they weren't, uh, than they were allowed finally. Um, next, like I said, we had these Mercury 7 gentlemen and these Mercury 7 gentlemen, these astronauts, they were married. And to um, make them more attractive, the males more attractive to the audience at large, so to the American public, they actually did a number of public relations uh, magazine and newspaper articles about their wives. And one of the reasons uh, that Je John Glenn and others didn't want the female, uh, you know, the females that had been selected by Dr. Lovelace to be a pilot, to be an astronaut like John Glenn and the others is because they felt that there was a fair chance that the public would love the female astronauts more and would give them, you know, more, uh, more applause, uh, you know, more fan mail and all these other things. So, you know, would be, you know, bigger uh, and fa more famous than the men. And so John Glenn actually stopped it. It's one of the things he did uh, when there was a hearing in Congress, he said something really, um, nasty, I would say, about women, that they weren't, you know, capable of doing this, that they should be mothers and they should be, you know, cooking and, you know, doing household chores, but not being pilots because they weren't really fit for that. Which it, of course it's is like, possible. yeah, his whole thing was like, men go off to war, men fly planes, that is not for women to do. So mm -hmm. it's like, and Jerry Cobb was very, uh, I mean, she wanted so badly and was very well equipped and very well qualified to be an astronaut. But based on uh, his testimony and others by NASA men, that's when they said no women quite yeah. yet. And Russia, as Artemis is gonna tell you, beat us by a long shot again oh, yes. space there. because this, this like i said this was you know this this fight this contest between america and russia showing who is best and who is you know uh technologically more you know better which is great but um it you know this was the result and the guys um i think these three guys in suits other well, other ones that didn't really go to the moon. They just, you know, they went all the way there. Uh, but you know, the Apollo 13, as we all know, uh, ran into some big problems. And then they, you know, they told Houston, Houston, we have had a problem. I always think that's very funny because the problem was still existing when they were giving, you know, this notice to Houston about it. So anyway, that's what they said. And so these are the Apollo astronauts. And, you know, like I said, all men. Now, many, many years later, um, you know, it, it, when we were celebrating 50 years on the moon, oh, I slipped. Then you still had these guys, these uh, eight guys and the one in this really spunky suit in gray and with these amazing socks, that's Buzz Aldrin. Um, who has a quirky sense of humor, and I like it because all the rest are in, you know, very official, really nice uh, smokings. Uh, but his smoking was a bit different. Um, and this is, you know, Apollo 11 moonwalk and the moonwalk landing 50 years later, um, celebrating it. And these are the astronauts that were still alive and were capable and willing to come together and you know celebrate it with the government and you know have this have their picture taken now if you look at you know where we stand like i said these women are at the moment selected to be walking on the moon 
if the Artemis program gets enough funding to take off. Uh, but otherwise, you know, one of them might be the one walking on Mars, although that's about 13 years from now. So, you know, they might by that time be too old because those are the rules. Uh, if you're an astronaut, male or female, you have to be very fit and, you know, very strict uh, age limits. So they might be too old by then, but there will be other women because nowadays we do select women. It's no longer like then. This is the first female astronaut. Actually, she was a cosmonaut. Why do we say cosmonaut? It means you are an astronaut from the Russian, uh, from Russia or the Russian Federation. And Roscosmos is the name that we use for, um, for uh, the Russian um, agency. Uh, the thing is, what always surprises me as a European, if I see it written in English, it's with a C written which is silly because it's definitely not a C in the Russian language, it's a K. And we do have a K in English, so why you change that, I have no idea. But anyway, so it's Roscosmos, this woman, Valentini Tereshkova. Now, only uh, nine days ago, uh, we could celebrate Yuri's Night. I have no idea where you, whether any of you know what that is. Do you know what it is, Yuri's Night? What do we celebrate? Yuri's Night. Anyone? Anybody Raise your hand. There? Anybody? No. Oh, uh, Lucas, you know? What is Yuri's night? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me scroll through here. Anybody else know what Yuri's night is? Okay. I think we've got to tell them, Artemis. Yeah. So, Lucas, it's the, and, and all the others, it's the night we celebrate, uh, an evening with a party on the 12th of April, because Yuri Gagarin, that's the Yuri in Yuri's night, Yuri Gagarin, uh, you know, was uh, launched into space and he did some circles into space and then, you know, got back again. And um, he uh, was the first, theme, first man to get into space. And then, like I said, it was this, this contest between Russia and America. So when America didn't select any females, the Russians thought, hey, we can do better. And so they selected a female, and this woman, this Valentina Tereshkova, she went into space on the 16th of June, 1963. And actually, as there is a Yuri's Night, I myself, with many females working in space industry and space agencies, celebrate on the 16th of June with a lunch and a speaker, her launch into space. Now, why was she selected in, in, in Russia? She was a fighter pilot? No, she wasn't. The only thing she needed to be able to do was to, to use a parachute. Because actually um, the uh, landing of the, um, the uh, spacecraft wasn't with the, what, the cosmonaut in it. Neither Yuri Gagarin nor Valentina Tereshkova you know, landed on uh, Earth. Uh, they actually uh, jumped from the spacecraft before it landed. And so she needed to be able to, um, to be a parachutist. And she was, because that was kind of her hobby. She never, when she started it, I don't think she was thinking, oh, I want to be an astronaut. She just thought, you know, jumping out of a plane with a parachute was really cool. And it was a cool feeling of gliding in through the sky until you land again. That's why she did it. And because she was actually a factory worker, she wasn't a scientist. Like I said, she wasn't a pilot. She was just a Russian young woman uh, with a hobby, and this hobby got her into space. So she went into space for three days, you know, June 16, launch. She came back on June 19, 1963. And, you know, this was, you know, a, a public relations stunt, actually, more by, um, you know, by Russia. That was all it was. Now, uh, only uh, a few months later, she married uh, an astronaut uh, or a cosmonaut, uh, of course is the right word, uh, Mr. Nikolaev, because this whole idea that this woman, you know, could be an astronaut, could go into space, even in Russia, wasn't really the way they, should, they thought about it. They felt that she should be a mother and, you know, a wife. So they kind of marry her off to this guy and... Um, and so she, she had two kids with him and she never went into space again. And that was it for her. Now, there was another uh, female astro uh, cosmonaut, uh, 
not much longer uh, after that. Um, that was Svetlana uh, Soviet, uh, so Savitskaya. Um, I said, not long after that, look at it, 1963, 1982, which tells you it really was a public relations stunt. It had nothing to do with believing that females were equal to men and could be you know, doing the same things as men, because believe me, there were a lot of male cosmonauts in between 1961, Yuri Gagarin, and this year that finally a female, another and the second female from Russia was sent into space. So, you know, th this is just how it is. And now, was it much better on the uh, American side? I showed you all these guys that went to the moon. And of course, after that, we did Skylab. We did a lot of other stuff. It wasn't that we didn't do anything anymore after the last moon landing in 72, but no females, still no females. And then finally in 1983, so even a year after the lady, the second lady from Russia, almost a year, uh, Sally Wright, the first female American astronaut went in to the Skylab, the very first one. So finally, women get a foot in the game. Well, there were still a lot of ideas of what a woman should really be like. And, you know, let alone, you know, all these people that were went into space, males as well, all the men, they had my skin color. No, no brown, no darker than brown, nothing, just white people. And so there were some African-American um, male astronauts. And I think Charles Bolden was one of, if not the first, one of the first. He later became the boss of NASA. And then finally in 1992, on the 12th of September, May Jameson became the first female African-American astronaut. Before that, if there were females, they were all white. That's just the way it was. I told you I'd bias, you know, two weeks ago. Well, this was, of course, all bias because believe me, people of any color did go to very interesting schools. They had good education. And it wasn't like they weren't able, just like the females were just as able as the males, male Americans. No, they weren't selected. Now she was selected. I met her two years ago, very nice lady. Interesting, still very much involved with STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and math outreach for uh, younger children like you. And, um, you know, who was really the leading everything? Now, you must have heard about Johnson Space Center. I do believe you did. You all know what that is. That's where the astronauts train. There's a big, big water tank. It's so big that they, you know, they place the International Space Station inside it, parts of it. And then the astronauts underwater in, you know, of course, not in a spacesuit. Are they in a spacesuit? Yeah, they might be in their spacesuit. In their spacesuits, they, they train what it's like to do all the things they have to do at the International Space Station while underwater, because that's the best way of mimicking what it feels like when you're, you know, weightless in space. Now, in 1994, finally, the first female became director of this very important NASA facility because if you know if, if this is the place where people are trained and tested and selected then you understand that having a female as an as, as a director might make a difference in how you look at stuff not completely but she might bring her own ideas her own uh, background into it and that's probably a bit different than all the males so, you know, it was kind of like looking up. If we had a female astronaut now into space, we had, uh, we've had, you know, even of color, you know, it, it was kind of looking like, oh, we're getting there. And finally, you know, because we were talking Russia and the USA, right? And of course, the European Space Agency, ESA, had its own astronauts, but you guessed it, all males until the year 1996. This female, Claudie Henriere, went into space. She went to the MUR, uh, that's the, the Russian space uh, station, um, which either means world or uh, peace, that word in, in Russian. And she was the first female astronaut. And she only was astronaut for a few years. In 1999, she decided no longer to be an astronaut. 
She became a member of the French government. She was a French uh, um, astronaut. And so again, Europe had no female astronauts, only males, quite a number until this lady came aboard. Um, she went, she was sent, I think she was selected in 2012. And uh, she was sent after a lot of training, of course, to the International Space Station on the 23rd of November, 2014. And she actually is a fighter pilot, but she's also a scientist. She, uh, she um, studied um, many languages. She's multi, many, very multilingual, a polyglot, as we say. Um, and she also studied a lot of science. Um, and so, you know, being a fighter pilot and a scientist, of course, made her a very good candidate. So she became uh, the second female astronaut. You do realize 1996, then 1999, Claudia Henriquet said, no, I no longer want to be an astronaut. Then it takes 15 years before the next female astronaut from Europe is getting into space. That's not really helping a lot, is it? It's not really going fast, which is really a pity because of course, by 2000, by 2014, you know, that's not so long ago. I would say you all know that by now girls and boys get the same education. So there's no real reason why females shouldn't fly just like males. Uh, hey, Artemis, you got a question from Lucas. I saw your yes. hand, sweetheart. It's been there for a while. What was your question, sweetie? Um, I've, um, I've, um, I've heard about some, um, Samantha Chris Betty before, um, or whatever it is. Her last name is since 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 she flew with Terry Volt on the International Space Station. Oh, because you you uh, you love Terry Volts. It's like I'd have to yeah. see if we could get him on and everything. But thank you. I just wanted to see what your question was, baby. All right, okay. back to you, Artemis. Okay, so you know, so I told you, you know, um, in 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 ninety three, someone became director of Johnson Space Center, and how very important that is. Now, of course, there is also NASA's boss, which is called the administrator. And we still didn't, don't have had a female boss of NASA, but at least in 2005, we finally got a, you know, a secondary boss, the deputy administrator of NASA, Shana Dana. So it's, you know, it, it, it's, again, it's getting there. And there have been more females. There have been two, at least that I know after this. Um, so um, yeah, Lori Garver has been a um, deputy administrator. Uh, David Newman uh, has been a deputy administrator uh, very recently. So, you know, it's fi finally we're getting there also, you know, there are more and more females being um, selected. Now I've been talking about astronauts that were in, in, uh, working for the government. It was either Russia, it was uh, America, could have been a European country, it could also be Canada, or it could be um, uh, Japan. You know, those were all countries that, you know, selected astronauts and sent them up. And somewhere in between, there was this idea that people who were really, really, really wealthy, because we're talking 20 million, $25 million or more, would be allowed to go to the International Space Station. Well, if I say allowed, then I'm not talking about the American ideas about it. They didn't really, NASA didn't want, uh, you know, civilians, even if they were trained to go to the space station. But when the Soviet Union no longer was a, a federation and they were really in need of money in their space program, and so they started to sell um, what you could say, you know, tickets. It was more, it was, you know, places on there so used to get to the space station to very wealthy people. And they would select them also, you know, it wasn't just you show up and you're wealthy and okay, you can fly. You would have to train. They would make sure that you're really healthy enough. Otherwise, they wouldn't allow you. Um, and she, Anusha Ansari, went to the International Space Station on the 18th of 2006, after a few males that were very, very rich had gone there as well. And I think Dennis Dieter was the first. Um, 
uh, so she went there and she actually trained not just to make sure that she you know she would be healthy enough and would know what you know how to uh, what to what to do not to break anything if you're up there. Um, she also trained really to do research because her idea was she trained for 18 months to do the research just about the same amount of time as a normal astronaut from either you know NASA, Russia, or you know all the other European Space Agency or whatever who train who were in, in the employment of the government to do research on the International Space Station. She, Anusha Ansari, did actually the same amount of training to make sure that when she was at the International Space Station, she wouldn't just be, you know, snapping pictures out of the window or snapping pictures inside. You know, she actually would also work there. And that's what she did. And uh, and as far as I know, she, she found that it was an amazing thing to happen to you. So, you know, lucky her that she could afford it. Now, I said, Russia, U uh, USA, Europe. And if I say the European Space Agency, they're actually countries part of that. They're not actually in Europe, Canada. Canada is part of the European Space Agency group, which is kind of silly because we all know Canada is not in Europe. You know, it's, it's above the United States of America. But anyway, so these three groups. And then finally, China built up its own human space flight. And they actually did that by buying knowledge and people with the knowledge from the Russian uh, space agency, which has been, you know, going uh, almost bankrupt. Um, and so now we have a fourth big country or big conglomerate uh, that's able to send humans to space. And of course, they selected uh, guys first. You, uh, I don't have to explain that to you. But in 2009, they started to select females. And the females that were selected were only selected from, again, fighter pilots. And only those could be candidate tycoons. Now, I told you the word for a Russian astronaut is cosmonaut. So this, uh, this, if you say astronaut, you say you're a traveler to the stars. And if you say you're a cosmonaut, you're a traveler to the cosmos, so to the universe. And a tycoonaut is, is about the same word, a traveler to the tycoon, to the uh, universe, um, is what this word is. So fighter pilots, and they selected them. And then, of course, one was going to be the first. And uh, that's this lady, Liu Yang. She was the first female um, tycoon on, on the 16th of June, 2012. Remember, 16th of June, 1963, the first female in space. So all these many years later, nearly 50 years later, you have this female astronaut, this Chinese woman. Now you would think, you know, in these nearly 50 years, we have changed a lot. And the idea about what women should be or should not be, you know, what John Glenn said that, you know, men go off to war and women, you know, they really, you know, should be in the house and should do homework. And I'm not talking homework for school, but I'm talking, you know, cooking and cleaning. And um, actually in China, it hadn't changed them a lot because although the uh, male astronauts could be whatever they wanted to be, um, let me see, these females were actually had to be married and had to have children. They had to be mothers. Otherwise, they would not be selected. That's a very silly way of doing it. Partly that's because because they are afraid that they believe they believe that if you're a female and you go into space because of space radiation you afterwards might not be able to give birth to healthy babies so they want the women to have babies before they go into space that's not completely uh, strange but as such still it's you know it's a lot of bias going on now we had all these astronauts and cosmonauts, females, finally. You would think that the first Russian cosmonaut, the first Russian female astronaut to go to the International Space Station would have happened long before this date, but only in 2014, so less than six years ago, finally a Russian cosmonaut, female, 
default to the International Space Station. You do understand that, you know, the people that are going to the International Space Station are for a very large part Russian and Americans, yes, but a lot of Russians. And those were all males for decades, all males. And of course, we're talking the International Space Station, it was only like a decade, but before that, the other Skylab, Mer, all the other space stations we've had, only males. This was the first to go to the International Space Station. Now, there's this other thing. You know, we were supposed to go and have a spacewalk, an all-female spacewalk. And that was supposed to happen before this date of the 19th October 2019. But it didn't happen. You know why? They didn't have a spacesuit in the right size for the other female. The other female was shorter. And there are only a very limited number of spacesuits up there in the International Space Station. And they didn't have another spacesuit fit for a woman. They only had, you know, tall sizes. And she needed a medium. So they had to wait, uh, I think, a, uh, a year, perhaps less. Um, it, was a, it was almost a year. Yeah, it was almost a year, right? And, you know, because what happens to the International Space Station, we all know, you know, you have these launch of these astronauts and they go to the International Space Station and, you know, they have to eat, of course, and they do these research and everything. Well, almost every month there is a, um, you could say, say it's a truck, you know, then a space truck that goes to the International Space Station and they're from, they could be uh, a, a European model or a Japanese model or an American model and they're stuffed of all the stuff that people need in the inter on the International Space Station, including spacesuits. And so they went and, you know, did a spacesuit uh, transfer to the International Space Station. So now finally, this all-female spacewalk finally, finally happened in 2019. Christina Koch and Jessica Mayer finally were able to walk in space. Now, it's, it's quite uh, interesting to know how many females are there really astronauts on all the astronauts in total. And if I'm saying astronauts, I mean all of them. Every person that really went into space and traveled into space, not just, you know, flew very high, but really went into space, there are 553 astronauts in total. And that's European astronauts, American astronauts, Russian, Chinese, Japanese, don't care, all of them, male and female. 65, so 553, 65, and so that's a little bit over 10% are females. The rest were all males. And these pictures weren't actually, uh, you know, done because of a bias over women. Uh, you know, this happened to be, you, you have, as an astronaut, you have to go to, to the Johnson Space Center sometimes, and then they want to have your official astronaut picture taken. And, um, you know, for one reason or the other, perhaps she didn't have child, someone to, uh, you know, to be, to babysit this four-year-old son of her, or perhaps her son just wanted to come and she thought it was a good idea. I don't know. This wasn't planned by NASA. But she brought her son and they did these official pictures, you know, of the astronaut with their, with their helmet under their arm looking really, you know, very, very serious. And then the, uh, the person taking the picture said, you know, let's take a few pictures with your son. And of course, you know, uh, her, her baby boy, four year old, uh, thought it was great fun. And here is a picture of him kissing his mom. So 65 females and of course all of them are much more than just wives and mothers. They're simply scientists, uh, pilots, and all these other, you know, things you need to be to become what you are. Now, if we're talking space astronauts, we always talk government, right? And a few uh, tourists that go up and that's it. But, you know, who gets us into space? It's not just, you know, the leaders of NASA. It is also the leaders of space industry. And I've just picked her as a picture, but I know that big companies 
like Virgin Crocodile, Boeing, they have females in the highest level of the uh, of the uh, board of directors. So it isn't just you know the the astronauts or just the director of Johnson Space Center that's important. And I think this one is really important. SpaceX, and if I say SpaceX, or would say Elon Musk, right? Elon Musk, that's SpaceX. Well, yes and no, because this woman, Gwen Shotwell, has been leading uh, SpaceX since the very beginning. She herself told me she was uh, she was employee number seven, so the seventh person that you know was hired by Elon Musk to be in his company. I noticed that Wikipedia says that she was the eleventh uh, employee. I will contact. Win and ask, you know, what's what, because then we need to change Wikipedia on this. And she's been making sure that, you know, the rockets fly, that everything, you know, is built, that, uh, that the company really flourishes. That's her job. Every, every rocket that goes up, that's her job. Of course, there are a lot of engineers and, and other people working with her, but she's the boss. She's the one that makes sure that SpaceX flies. So, you know, in that sense, a female has been in charge of a very important part of space flight for a long time. Um, now, if we're talking SpaceX, we're talking the Dragon. And if you see on the left hand side, the Dragon cargo, that's one of the trucks, space trucks that go to the International Space Station and bring all these science equipment and food and, and clothes and, you know, whatever they, they want, they need there, they bring it. But this, um, this capsule was always meant also to bring seven people maximum, that's the same amount that would fly up with the, internet, with the space shuttle to the International Space Station. So seven people up uh, to the International Space Station. And they've been testing. They've been, you know, trying to do this, that. They've been testing their big rockets. They've been testing the capsule that does the cargo. So the space truck has been going to the International Space Station for many years now. And next month, on the 27th of May, that's the planning. You know, there might change, of course, if the weather is really bad or something happens. It will be the first crewed mission of SpaceX to the International Space Station. However, Two men. I have no idea why. Because believe me, there are females capable of doing this. And as far as I know, there are females in the group of people that SpaceX selected and trained to go to the International Space Station with their, you know, with their Dragon capsule on top of the Falcon uh, uh, rocket. So I have no idea. I think it's very, very strange and very bad PR, if I may so, so, say something. You know, I'm so glad you said that, Artemis, because I thought I wondered the same thing. It's like, why not? Because it's like it's the first time in a very long time that we've launched from U.S. soil rather exactly. than Kazakhstan. So I I have a big question mark about that as well. So thank you for saying that. Yeah, and I I, I will personally, you know, ask when, you know, what's going on with this. So you know, <laughs> I've, I've been talking about space agencies and these are all their you know their nice logos and you have on top you have Roscosmos then you have NASA then you have the European Space Agency underneath there is ASI that's the uh, Italian Space Agency then JAXA which is the Japanese Space Agency DLR that's the German Space Agency then Canada Canada Space Agency then you have China then you have the Israel Space Agency and the UK Space Agency. And actually, there are a couple of more by now, because also uh, the uh, United Arab Emirates has a space agency. So, yeah, we are really getting more and more space agency. And, and Luxembourg has a space agency and, and Portugal has a space agency. So it feels like, you know, this is all government, right? This is all government, government, government. And, you know, with these few tourists uh, that are really wealthy and then go, can go into space, if they pay the Russians enough to go there, that's it. Well, not anymore, because things change. My good friend, Mindy, Dr. Mindy Howard, 
is slated to fly to the, into, into space as a commercial astronaut, a female commercial astronaut, actually as a leader of people that are paying for it. She is like the travel leader, the, you know, the, your, your helper. She's training the people also. She's training them how to, you know, physically, but for a very large part, it's a mental training uh, that she's doing. And it, this is really important. Why is it important? If you go to the International Space Station for the government or even as a, a space tourist, you'll be there for about 10 days, which means that, you know, you go up, uh, it takes a while to, to dock at the International Space Station. You get into the space station and then you have a couple of days there that you either work, but you work and sleep and you have some spare time and that's it. So you can really experience being in space. But if you are a um, commercial astronaut and if you're just, you know, a commercial, um, actually also kind of space tourist, and you fly either with space, or with Virgin Galactic or with... Uh, Blue Origin, then you actually won't be for many days in space. You will only be uh, up for, uh, I think, 90 minutes, which and only a few minutes of there. I'm not totally sure, but it's like six or 10 minutes, or something like that. So it's rather short. You will be weightless and being able to you look outside from your capsule and see the, that fact, uh, you know, proof with your own eyes that Earth is really a globe. You will see, you know, that there's a curvature, as we say. Um, and so if you are not trained mentally to be completely in the moment, you might be so overwhelmed with everything that's happening. You know, the G forces on your body while you're launched, you know, and then suddenly you're weightless, perhaps you're now very nauseous. You know, it's, it's, it's really overwhelming. And unless you are trained, to concentrate on what's happening, you might end up landing on Earth without really having experienced the way you wanted it, the full experience of you know being an astronaut, being weightless, being in space. So she's training people and she's helping people to make the best of it. So that's one part. Not and Artemis, when, uh, Mindy is actually online. I know. With us. Mindy, would you like to say anything? Mindy, uh, do you want to say hi to everybody? Hi, wait a second, let me, un I guess I can start my video. Can you yeah, there so I go. this is who Artemis was just speaking of, you guys. Hi, everyone. Artemis said it perfectly, actually. She, uh, she explained about the importance of training, and, and if you're not um, trained well, you're going to miss your entire experience if it's so quick. And it was actually, um, it's only four minutes of weightlessness. Um, oh, that, it's even less. That you'll get on a Virgin Galactic flight. So yeah, oh, um, yeah, crazy, but you explained it perfectly. But hi everyone, nice to meet you all. And I'll hand the floor back to Artemis. Thank you. Oh, beautiful. Yep. Thank you for being here. Sure, love okay. it. So, you know, so like I said, this is a commercial astronaut. Mindy is a commercial astronaut. She's not trained or picked by the government. And truth be told, uh, in the Netherlands, we're both in the Netherlands, um, we have a feeling that the um, European Space Agency and our government, you know, we have uh, a Dutch space office, are not really very happy that she is being hailed as an astronaut because they go like, we didn't select her. Yes, yeah, so what? I mean, this is modern times. I mean, the days that it's all only government are over. The moment SpaceX, you know, has its crewed cabin that goes up, it's not just the United States of America who can pay for that launch. It's, you know, private organizations, private companies, wealthy private people, they can pay and they can go. And the same holds, you know, and that's really going into space, you know, more than four minutes. And the other companies that, you know, are aiming for suborbital flights, like Virgin Galactic, like uh, uh, Blue Origin, uh, um, they actually, you know, they can, again, if you have money, you can go into space. Now, this picture that I'm showing you is the first female German astronaut. Why is that a point? Why is that a thing? Well, Germany was supposed to select an astronaut uh, two years ago for the European Space Agency and then present the selection and then the European Space Agency could say, no, we are picking a Portuguese astronaut, not the German one, you know. There could have been, but they, the pre-selection 
of astronauts should have been from Germany and from other countries. And of course, in Germany, there were females that applied and they were most certainly uh, qualified, but none of the females were selected and two or three males were presented to the European Space Agency. So two or three German males were presented as candidate astronauts to the European Space Agency and none of the females. And now the lady, uh, if you can see my cursor, this lady, Claudia Kessler, who is the uh, founder and CEO of a, uh, is a uh, employment agency that you know, selects people to work for a space industry or the European Space Agency, she was very angry. And so she started this project, which is called the female astronaut in German, that's called the Astronautin. And uh, she selected some ladies and she has them trained, uh, Dr. Susanna Randall and Dr. Inza Thiele Eich. And these were ladies that had, I think, applied to uh, Germany to be uh, presented to the European Space Agency and they weren't. And so they are training, and this is a picture actually at Johnson Space Center where they uh, were visiting and uh, talking about training because she wants to make sure that there will be a female German astronaut. And she is putting a lot of her own money in this because like I said, she wants to make sure it's more than this. Now, of course, everything we're doing, everything I am doing is about this first footstep on Mars. Will that be by a female? I have a secret to tell. Many years ago, when I started in space industry, that's really decades ago, um, I was still one of the few females. And so a lot of female um, uh, male colleagues, and they would all say to me, you know, if we go to Mars, it will not be like on the moon, a woman will be the first one to step on Mars. And I was like, yeah, you know, you don't need to sweet talk me to me. I'm fine, you know, it, there will be females there. And yeah, it might be a female, but you know, why am you telling this to me? Well, I found out later in, uh, you know, in a few years time, I'm not sure exactly, but astronauts actually told me that among them, they had decided that whomever was going to be sent to, uh, to Mars, there will be females in that crew, because if, the, if NASA is paying, that means that's taxpayers' money of Americans, and the rules and regulations of taxpayer money is that there cannot be bias, so there will be females in that crew, American females, and so, and perhaps also European females, that's my hope, um, and they, uh, you know, and the astronauts among themselves have said, you know, the first step on the moon was a male astronaut. Now we're going to another heavenly body, to this planet, Mars. Then if we are getting there, then the first step will be a woman. So let's hope it will be true. Funny thing is, and I've showed you this picture Some before. Things are being a bit frozen there. There you oh, go. Am I back again? You're good now. Yeah. Okay. It was just a for momentarily. Yeah. This, this is a poster for the program that the European Space Agency made in 2001, so many years ago, to show that, you know, this is what we're going to do, and now we're going to get all the way and put humans on Mars. And like I said, in 2001 already, European Space Agency officially portrayed a female astronaut on Mars and not a male. Now, I think I'm going to stop. I mean, I have a lot more things to tell about, you know, uh, other important ladies, because thankfully, a lot of um, females are in charge. And the German uh, space agency, DLR, is actually led by a female, Pascal Ehrenfreund, who is an astrobiologist, so a scientist, and not just a manager, which is interesting. Anyway, let's stop and let's have your questions. All right, beautiful. If you'll stop your sharing screen options and then we'll see everybody. Here's what we'll do, guys. We've got about uh, 20 or so people on. I want to hear your thoughts or questions. Jesse, you had a great one about the difference between what a commercial astronaut is. Why don't we come to you first since that's what I got in chat. So is a, uh, is a commercial astronaut when we're talking about commercial do we mean that 
just the regular everyday citizens can fly to space or are we talking like training with certain companies or anything like that? Well, a commercial astronaut is an astronaut picked by a company and not by a government. So a commercial astronaut could be, um, it could be actually a commercial astronaut being sent to the International Space Station, you know, if a company would be willing to pay for it. But for the rest, mostly a commercial astronaut at the moment, but this could change. And the moment means suborbital flights, just going, you know, into space for a few minutes, four minutes, Mindy, Mindy said, and then coming back again. But it's, it's not... Um, it, so that's the commercial parts, you know, that commercial parties, which means companies, are paying for it instead of governments. And uh, can I ask you, Mindy, I'm going to unmute you. Um, let's see here. We have a, a, a girl online. Her name is Dharma. And her goal is to go become a fighter pilot, go to the Air Force Academy, and then pursue, uh, let's see if I... Not having any luck unmuting you. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So would you talk to maybe, especially Dharma and some of my other females on here may have those questions, but she's been dreaming of being an astronaut now for eight years. She's 13 years old. So she's been dreaming of it since she was five. You'll see her. Dharma, can you wave at everybody? That's Dharma. That's my future astronaut. Can you tell her a little bit about your process in becoming a commercial astronaut? Yeah, sure. Um, well, uh, anyway, I, I, I think it's a great idea that you like the idea of becoming a fighter pilot because that can always help you. Um, like Artemis said, you know, the fight, fighter pilots as one of the things on your resume always weighs very heavily um, traditionally. To be honest, I don't always understand why, but um, this has been the tradition of, of selecting the pilots from uh, you know, it's selecting astronauts from people who have been in the military before. So it, it's always a good thing. Now, um, how, how to go in uh, to get there? I mean, it's funny because Artemis was mentioning standards of fighter pilots. And I, I also tried to become a fighter pilot, but I was told at the time I was an inch too short. I think they have changed things now. Um, I don't understand. Oh, <laughs> it's unbelievable. I, I'm five foot three, um, but I think they've even, I, I think they now have accepted five or three as that's like 160 centimeters for um, people in Europe. Yeah, the thing, of course, if you, if you say that a person are not, is, is supposed to be a certain height, you're actually also having a bias against a lot of non-white people. Because not everyone is as tall as people are in the Netherlands. Because, yeah, I'm very under tall. We agree on that. <laughs> but most people here are six foot, you know, something, six, six foot three, six foot seven, quite normal. If I have a conversation, I have to look up. You know, that's the way in the Netherlands it is. So, and, and Mindy knows, you know, if you look, walk on the street and you see 20 year old people, uh, so, you know, students or young employees in, in, in companies, then most of them are extremely tall. If they're not, then they probably are, you know, from migrant uh, stock recently because even those migrants that came in two generations ago and i don't care where you came from they will have grown and you know there's this this um something in scientists the are not quite sure why we grow is perhaps because we drink a lot of milk uh, even if we're adults i don't know but it's you know we are the milk and the cheese but <laughs> anyways i mean uh so I didn't, I didn't manage to get into the Air Force Academy because apparently people could not figure out how to design a chair for me to sit in that um, that was tall, you know, that was okay to accommodate my size. Now, now they have better ergonomics, and now uh, somebody like who's my size is allowed to get in. But anyway, I don't know how tall you are. How tall are you, Dharma? Let me unmute you, baby. How tall are you, Dharma? can hear you. Hey, Dharma, how tall are you, baby? You're on mute. Oh, yeah. Let's see. No, she's not on mute. Say it again. I'm going to read your lips. Five foot. Five foot? Two. Five foot. Three. Five foot three. Okay. You're in. <laughs> okay. At least your height is not going to work against you. No. So assuming um, you are getting decent grades in school and you do some team sports, which I think 
um, is helpful for getting into ex get your extracurricular activities, yes. both as an astronaut and as a fighter pilot. Um, you know, that's always looked well upon. So um, if you haven't started doing team sports yet, maybe pick one that you would like and staying active, physically fit, and then of course getting good grades. All of those things are, are, are really helpful to um, getting into the Air Force Academy. Um, and then if you uh, can fi finish your degree, and you want to become a, um, a nat are you an American or are you a European? I didn't understand where you were from. Because she's, American. I'm not sure what, yeah, American. so she's American. in, uh, yeah, Hagerstown, Maryland. Okay, there you go. So, um, so if, you know, when, when you've gotten your degree and you're a fighter pilot, then um, you can apply to become a NASA astronaut. That's probably the best time to do it. Um, after you, um, you have to have at least a bachelor's. Uh, I think now it's actually a master's. They've changed it um, to a master's this year. Uh, it used to be just a bachelor's and now it's, um, so you'll have to then go and get um, uh, your master's in something and maybe something scientific so yeah. you can understand how to do some experiments um, yes. when you get to, when you get to the International Space Station. But as, as uh, Artemis was saying, you, there are other ways to potentially get to space that like I'm like I'm going to be doing because I tried those ways and unfortunately I didn't make it but luckily um, there is um, a competition called the career astronauts uh, competition and people who have gotten a bachelor's now you're still a little bit too young for that but who knows when you you know get your bachelor's you can apply also for this competition um, they're going to go through different types of um, challenges where people will learn how to work together, for example, underwater to do similar tasks that astronauts will do, like repair uh, a mock space station and um, or, you know, going into caves and working together and doing sort of um, kind of uh, cave exploration, similar to what how the astronauts train and the winners of that, uh, the winners of the competition, four people will win four tickets to go on a Virgin Galactic, probably. Uh, we're not sure if it's Virgin Galactic or Blue Origin, but one of these suborbital space flights. So you can get a chance to, you know, if you win the competition, it's absolutely free. You do not have to pay anything. And yet, then you'll be trained um, to, to go into a suborbital flight. So you'll get um, parabolic flight training, which is where you'll feel like what that weightlessness was. That, that picture that Artemis showed earlier of me um, was taken in a parabolic flight. So you can actually um, pay for these flights. I think they're about $5,000 um, to take. It's about a one hour flight and you get about 15 parabolas where you'll feel every single time in, you're on the top of the parabola, you'll be weightless for 22 seconds. And then you'll come crashing down to the ground and then you'll be weightless again and then you'll come crashing down to the ground and there's pads all over the the wall so that's one way you can feel what it's like to be weightless here on earth and then the other two trainings that I, we're suggesting are good ideas because as artemis said before if you don't train yourself this this suborbital flight which is only 90 minutes long is going to be over before you know it so the second training would be going into a centrifuge and feeling what it's like to, to get launched. And, and everything. so when, when you're getting launched on Virgin Galactic or, um, or any of these suborbital vehicles, as well as, um, let's say, going to the ISS, you're going to have tremendous G-forces um, pulling blood out of your brain, pushing it down into your feet. And if you don't learn how to breathe properly, and keep the blood in your, your head, yes. um, you're going to pass out. You're just going to black out. And so that would not be fun because you will miss your trip. Um, and so you got to learn these breathing techniques. I'll just do it one really quick because it's not going to look, it's not going to be pretty the way it sounds. But I'll, if you put your hands, everybody have a chair, put their hands on a chair. If you can see my chair, I'm, I'm sitting here with, okay. You're going to put your hands on a chair and you're going to take your feet like you're going to be pushing against um, a footrest. And I want everybody to just take their shoulders and kind of bear downwards, kind of when I say bear down, I mean like push down and hold your breath in and squeeze in 
and I'll do this in a second. And then when you do that, you, you got to kind of push almost, it sounds not very glamorous, like you're going to the bathroom. So you got to kind of tense your stomach muscles up and go, <gasps> and then do, hold that for four seconds and then take another breath and then down. <laughs> two, three, four, and then up. Take a breath. Again, one more time. Down. One, two, three, four. Okay. And every time you do that, you're forcing the blood into your brain. And then it, it's not pretty, but it's going to make you not pass out. And if, and if everybody's doing this, you'll feel how hot your head is. Yes, really, yes, my whole face yes. is really warm right now because I just pushed all this blood in my brain. I'm almost sweating. And you got to do that like several times when you're launching, um, when you're on launch or else that blood will go. So that's how you do that. Just keep kind of tensing and then bearing down and holding your breath and squeezing and then take a deep breath in. And that's how you, that's one of the breathing techniques. So that's what you're going to have to learn also. And the last training thing is a mental training, which is what um, my inner space training is all about. How to get people to relax and stay calm while all this stuff is going on uh, around you. So all these three trainings are really important. I'm going to pass it back over to you, Artemis, and to Janet. But anyway, um, thank you for your question. And Dharma, yes. brilliant. So you, uh, you make us proud. And, and uh, I, I really hope you get there one way or another, either by commercial space or by being a NASA astronaut. I think she's well on her way. Now, uh, Tapaswini from India, you had a question, my dear? Uh, usually what happens is uh, during flights or even space flights, uh, sometimes we get scared uh, when it's the first time or even when we're used to something, even then we uh, get scared a lot of times. So how do you deal with such things? Great. So how do you deal with your fear? Maybe that's to Mindy or even to Artemis of people that have gone into space. How do, pe how do you deal with your fear? Well, face it. I mean, the thing is, don't deny that you will be fearful. You're a human being and these situations are you know, more dangerous than sitting on your chair looking at this screen, I presume. So, you know, acknowledge that and also think about it before you go and also realize that, you know, you might be afraid, but if you go into space uh, or do anything else, but especially if you go into space, then there are so many people that have been working really hard to make sure that it's a success and that you survive and that everything goes well that you actually are safer going into space, I think, than riding a bus. Because I do not believe that we have that many, you know, um, um, tests and whatever for a normal bus ride. But we do have those if you go into space. So I do believe that, you know, acknowledge the fact that you're afraid because that's normal. And there's nothing wrong with being afraid. Just realize that, you know, being courageous is not being without fear, it's being, having fear but still doing what needs to be done you know still going through it that's having courage not you know being unafraid because that's actually very unnatural mm -hmm. great question great answer anything you want to add mindy to that well um sure I, it's funny because one of the the dutch astronauts who is the unknown dutch astronaut leopold <clears throat> on the bear um uh He's a guy who had to become American in order to fly with the Americans uh, and do research. And he was at a conference that I happened to go to and I asked him if he was ever fearful. Um, and he said, he was terrified. He said, and you know, cause we like to think that astronauts are Superman, super women and who don't get scared of anything. But um, he was quite honest. And he said that um, even though he practiced his parabolic flight stuff on earth and he knew what it felt like to go weightless he says the first time you know when he got up in orbit and he was going to take his seatbelt off to fly around he says i didn't dare do it i felt i was paralyzed i couldn't do anything and he and someone actually in the cabin who he was flying with had to kind of like look at him and kind of coax him and say come on we'll do this together and kind of took his hand and even though he was, you know, he had training, he was still really scared. And I thought 
this is this is fascinating because usually if you ask NASA, you know, about fear and everything, and you'll typically get the answer is, you know, we train our astronauts so well that, um, you know, it, it, they can do things in their sleep. You know, they, they're so they're so trained um, that typically they don't get any kind of fear. But Leopold um, mentioned this to me, and I so I I, I think also what Artemis is saying is, you know, you know, everybody is human. Yeah. Even if you have the training, I think the training really helps in order to minimize these kinds of like deer in a headlights, fight or flight kind of feeling that you're going to get, you know, especially the first time. I think it's, you know, like the first time I was in a centrifuge and I felt six G's on my body, I was also like, wow, this is pretty heavy. And, you know, the second time was less, the third time was better, the fourth time was better. And then I started to relax more. And, you know, so most of these astronauts that will go to the ISS will have a lot of training um, so that it, they can do things in their sleep, even, you know, but chances are, uh, so chances are they're not going to be frozen like this, like Leopold from the Baron was, but it still can happen. So you're going to need other techniques to, like good breathing exercises to try to kind of help yourself calm down. And that can also be practiced um, before that you fly. So, and then the last kind of thing is um, maybe someone can help, you know, someone more experienced can kind of coax you through it. But hopefully you don't have to be at that point, um, you know, when, when you're actually in space that you're still scared, but it's, it's totally possible, you know, that the, the anxiety can come even, even if you're trained, but chances are much, 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 much less, you know, the training really, really helps a lot. So, but we're not perfect, you know? And the first time we do something, it's always scary. And then after that, it gets easier and easier. That's that's why training is so so important. Great, you guys. Go ahead. A bit Arthur. about this this Dutch astronaut that was afraid. This the thing is, he wasn't really an astronaut. This was a scientist working for a company. He was a uh, one of the world renowned scientists in growing crystals. Now his company wanted to know if you grow crystals in you know zero gravity, will they grow better? or different or you know whatever happens you know it's they they wanted to do research and they had asked nasa you know can we bring someone up uh, to the skylab because the international space station didn't exist yet in the 80s and 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 yeah you know nasa said that's fine you know if you want to do this very specific research that you know it would take far too long for any astronaut to be trained in that you simply have to select your own company person who is willing and able to do this in space. And, you know, that's up to you. And of course, we will also vet this person to see whether this person is really good enough to go into space. So, you know, there was this, you know, this group of people that were saying, yeah, yeah, I want to be selected. Yeah, I want to go for the company into space. And he had this, this boss of Lodewijk van der Berg had to bring a list of 10 people. And he got stuck, nine people volunteered. He couldn't find the 10th person. And so he went to Lodewijk, who, like I said, he was world renowned in growing crystals. And that was exactly what they wanted to do in space. And he said, Lodewijk, do you mind if I, you know, add your name to the list? And Lodewijk, who is actually a really short person, you should look up pictures. I will try to find some pictures of him and the other astronauts going up because it's really kind of ridiculous. You have all these really tall people, normal tall people, and this really short, tiny person in between, and that was Lodewijk. And so what happened is that Lodewijk said, sure, and they both, you know, his boss and Lodewijk said, yeah, I will never be selected because, you know, look at me. I don't look like an astronaut at all. You know, no, they agreed on that. So of course the astronauts had to do certain tests. One of the tests was whether they really knew their stuff, you know, this growing of crystals. Now, I told you he was one of the best in the world. So sure enough, Lodewijk got selected to the smaller group of the 10, you know, and, you know, uh, OK, because, you know, he was really good at what he was doing at the company. So then, you know, they did some physical tests. And strangely enough, Lodewijk, this tiny little man who didn't want really to be an astronaut, he was just doing he hadn't planned on it at all, in the end was selected because he actually did best on all the tests, also the physical tests. So he ended up going into space 
And he had two passports, a Dutch and an American passport, because he had them both, as far as I know. And uh, like Mindy said, he had to be an American to do this because, you know, he was going on uh, into space with an American spaceship. So no uh, foreigners just like that allowed. And, um, and so he went up and he did his thing. And there was very little public relations, uh, you know, no big newspapers, articles about him at all, because he went into space just a few months before the first government selected Dutch astronaut, Dutch government selected European space agency selected Dutch astronaut, Wibbo Ockels was supposed to fly. And Lodewijk van der Bergen, I met him also in 2004 and several times afterward. He told me that he didn't want to steal the thunder of Wibbo Ockels because he didn't feel like it was a real astronaut. It just kind of happened to him. It was never planned. It wasn't like the other one. So, he said, you know, it's fine. I don't need, you know, media all over me, you know, television interviews, etc. So he was kind of like a normal person going almost like a space tourist going into space. And so sure, he was not as well trained as the other NASA astronauts. So he was probably more in tune with his fear and all the other things yet still. And so I immediately believed that he said, you know, he was, you know, simply fearful, simply being a human being. And, um, and remember, girls and boys, this man was the best in his field on the world in growing crystals, but he didn't need to be the best astronaut. He didn't feel that he needed to present himself as being more courageous or better or whatever. He just was... Um, secure and confident in what he could do very well and so all the other things he took for you know he he took in stride he had to be an astronaut to grow these crystals fine he go into space for 10 days and do the growing and it actually was very successful um so that was is that's another thing it's okay to say i'm good in this but not good in something else that's also a very adult and actually i think also a very you know, balanced astronaut type of thing to do, to say, yeah, I, I'm great in this, but I can't sing. That's I lovely. Oh. One, one more thing about, we've been talking a lot about short people, but I can tell, I just, for anybody who's short, um, there's good news because you will be better equipped in a centrifuge um, because most people who are tall with long necks have a much harder time in surviving the G-forces and being oh. okay with it. Shorter people have a, typically a much easier time in the centrifuge. So the things oh. that you can do, they Is have... that the reason why I always feel okay with 3G and all the other people around me go like, oh, oh I need to vomit. <laughs> I go like, oh, fine. <laughs> there are advantages in being small in space. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's well, fun. you guys have been so wonderful. I know some of you have to go on to your other classes. Mindy, thank you so much for joining us this morning. That's so guys, I want to announce a few of them uh, are not with us today, but the winners of Miss Sydney's kind of like writing 250 word uh, contest are Maggie with your fantastic story. You will be receiving an autographed book. So it's like, uh, she even sent me an autographed copy, so I feel very lucky. Ella, you also are going to receive a book. And let's see, Christopher is not on here today. And Micah, I named you also an honorary mention there. So you are too are going to get a book. So all of you guys be looking for those. I just, um, it's taking a while to get those things from Amazon at the moment, but as soon as I get them, I will e uh, mail those out to you. So thank you for doing your homework. If you haven't sent your body map, yesterday was kind of the deadline. So I'm gonna send those on to Dr. Susan Ipjewel. Last week, we also had that moment where Dr. Ryan Kobrick was talking about designing your own spacesuit. He wants to take a look at those. And uh, tomorrow, don't miss tomorrow, we'll have Dodd Galbraith back. He's going to be talking about Earth's 
mimicry. So kind of today through tomorrow around the globe, we're celebrating Earth Day. So uh, there'll be a little bit of a challenge and a prize tomorrow. But if you're interested, you can tell your parents, hey, can we watch uh, the documentary Mercury 13 on Netflix? Because that will tell you the story of these amazing ladies who truly should have been astronauts had the world uh, been a little bit more accepting of the power of females and what they were able to accomplish. But I love and adore all of you. Thank you, Artemis, for another great presentation. You always bring something amazing. Mindy, thank you for joining. And again, let your mind revolve around this thought. The universe is always expanding. Let your mind do the same. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Take care, guys. Mwah.